Hello there. Today we will talk about COVID-19 vaccines in patients with autoimmune disease and immune suppressive conditions. My name is Rohit Agarwal. I'm a rheumatologist and associate professor of medicine at University of Pittsburgh. This is first part of two part series. In part one, we'll talk about Pfizer's mRNA vaccines that just got approval a few days ago on December 10th from FDA. First, as per New York Times coronavirus vaccine tracker, there are currently more than 50 vaccines in testing in humans, out of which 15 has reached final stage of testing, which is a phase three clinical trial. In US, there are four main late stage candidates currently. Two of them are Pfizer and Biotech, which got FDA approval last week. And another one is Moderna mRNA vaccine, which is currently under review by FDA. The two other are J&J, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca vaccines in development. Here is a list of leading vaccines currently in development. On the top, you can see Pfizer and Moderna, which are mRNA vaccines, followed by several vaccines through adenovirus vector vaccines, and then some are protein and inactivated vaccines in development. First, let's try to look at the comparison between the four main vaccines being studied in US. These are Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and J&J vaccine. First of all, I would like you to pay attention to the sample size and the participants getting vaccines. By the virtue of number of patients involved, these are large extensive clinical trial, which speaks to the uh, the rigorousness of these clinical trials. Moreover, two of them are mRNA vaccines or messenger RNA vaccines and other two are adenovirus vector vaccines. Also, I would like to emphasize that three of the four vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna and AstraZeneca requires two shots and J&J is developing a vaccine with what possible one shot. And three of them, again, Pfizer, Moderna and AstraZeneca require deep freezing, whereas J&J's one of the vaccine does not require deep freezing. Next, I want to talk about Pfizer BioNTech mRNA vaccine that got approval last week from FDA. The overall efficacy or effectiveness reported of this vaccine is 95%. It required two doses of intramuscular injection um, three weeks apart. And it also requires significant deep freeze storage at minus 70 degree, which will pose significant logistical challenges. Let us first discuss how mRNA or messenger RNA vaccines work. So far, um, traditional vaccines are either killed vaccines or live attenuated vaccines, which means the virus is live, but high, very weakened. When these vaccines are given, traditionally live or killed vaccines, our immune system mounts a response against them and it develops the memory so that in future when we see that bacteria, virus or bug, we are able to mount an immune response against it and then eliminate it. mRNA stands for messenger RNA, which is a genetic molecule present in any cells. In the case of this particular mRNA vaccine, it contains instruction for building a coronavirus protein known as spike protein. When this vaccine is injected in the muscle, the mRNA is taken up by human cells. Then mRNA instructs the human cells to produce the spike protein of COVID-19, which stimulates the immune response in the form of B and T cell against the spike protein. Ultimately, our immune cells forms a memory against the spike protein, which will protect us in future if our body sees an actual virus or infection. Let us now review the actual safety as well as effectiveness of this new mRNA vaccine from Pfizer and BioNTech. FDA recently reviewed the data from large phase three clinical trial, which was a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial on 44,000 patients, which led to the approval of this vaccine. In this trial, half of the patient got vaccine and half did not get vaccine. Overall, this vaccine was 95% effective after seven days of second dose, which is three weeks after the first dose. Now, this is a rock star performance by any vaccine ever developed and being tested on tens and thousands of patients is quite an achievement. Overall, only eight patients in COVID-19 vaccine group got COVID-19 
and 162 as compared to 162 patients in the placebo group, the patients who did not get the vaccine develop COVID-19 in the same time frame. As you can see in this graph, where the red line represents the COVID-19 infection rate in patients who got placebo, as compared to the blue line that represent COVID-19 infections in patients who got vaccine. The x-axis is days after the first dose of vaccine. As I hope you can appreciate, as soon as 7 to 10 days after the first dose, the curve separates out, showing the significant effectiveness of these vaccines as early as 10 days after the first dose. Overall effectiveness after the first dose was reported to be 52% and it reaches 95% after 7 days of second dose of vaccine. Also important to note that the vaccine was effective in preventing severe COVID infection as well as was effective in patients who were previously, um, previously had COVID-19 infection and it was effective even after the first dose. Another very important point that comes out of this data is that this vaccine was effective across all age groups, including patients above 65 years of age. And there were patients even enrolled in this file who were above 75 years of age. As well as it was effective in all genders, as well as all races and ethnicities. I hope with this data, you're convinced about the effectiveness of this vaccine. And the more important thing for me, the take home lesson for me is not only effective in a younger population or low risk population, it's actually effective across the board. No matter what gender you are, no matter what racial ethnicities you belong to, no matter what age group you have. And it also covers patients with significant comorbid conditions, including obesity, diabetes, and underlying lung conditions. Now, what about the safety? We'll talk about the specific safety of this vaccine. But before that, I want to reassure you that this trial was done on 44,000 patients in which half got drug and half did not. So in terms of the vaccine trial, this is one of the largest clinical trials we have seen. And surely I have never reviewed a clinical trial this big. Now, specifically, the most common side effect, which was seen in above 80% of patients, was injection site reaction. When the injection is given, you can develop some soreness, some redness, and swelling. And that happened in more than 80% of patients in this clinical trial as well. Other common side effects included fatigue, headaches, muscle pain, joint pain, fever, chills in, very, in large number of patients. Now, this is quite common for any vaccine because when a foreign body is introduced in our body, our body has to mount some sort of immune response. In fact, that's the reason that we will be in future protected from that particular virus. In evaluating safety of any clinical trial or any drug trial, the most important figure that I want to look at is frequency of serious adverse event or serious side effects. Fortunately, in this trial, the frequency of serious adverse event was 4.6% at the maximum which is very, very reassuring. And also, importantly, the patients who were above 55 years of age actually had less serious adverse event as compared to patients who, had, who were less than 55 years of age, which is also reassuring for an a, for a elderly patient population. This vaccine compared side effect profile of three different vaccines currently available. One, Shingrix in red, um, is a shingles vaccine, which is commonly used. Next is a Pfizer mRNA vaccine, the vaccine we are talking about today. Next is a flu vaccine, which is a common flu vaccine given every year. And the next column is the placebo rates. As you can see, the local pain and reaction is quite common in Shingrix or shingles vaccine and similarly seen in Pfizer vaccine as well. However, they were much more common as we commonly see in flu vaccine. Other side effects were also quite frequent in other vaccines as well, such as muscle pain or myalgia, fatigue, headache, chills, and fever, as well as GI symptoms of some nausea and vomiting. Now, thankfully, these side effects are often short-lived and patients generally recover from these side effects in few days. If I compare 
the shingles vaccine side effect profile with Pfizer vaccine side effect profile, I would say I don't see any major differences between the common side effects seen in these two vaccines. Thankfully, there was no autoimmunity seen in this vaccine trial. However, the data that we have currently is only on an average two months data. That means we can say for two months on an average, these vaccines were quite safe. The other thing is that mostly in these trials, autoimmune disease and patients who are on immune suppressive drugs are not enrolled. So we really don't have any particular data on patients with autoimmunity as well as patients with immune suppressive drugs. I must point out that there were four cases of Bell's palsy uh, in the vaccine group, whereas no case of Bell's palsy in placebo group. Now, these four cases are amongst 20,000 patients who were given this vaccine. So it's quite safe even if it causes Bell's palsy in minority of patients. Based on all the scientific evidence reviewed by FDA, FDA announced that they believe that the Pfizer and BioTech mRNA COVID-19 vaccine is effective in patients at age 16 or above. And they also said that overall benefit outweighs the known risk of this vaccine. With this, I hope I am able to summarize some key points of data involving this Pfizer mRNA vaccine. In the next video, we'll talk about what about the safety and effectiveness of this vaccine. Thankfully, there was no autoimmunity seen in this vaccine trial. However, the data that we have currently is only on an average two months data. That means we can say for two months on an average, these vaccines were quite safe. The other thing is that mostly in these trials, autoimmune disease and patients who are on immune suppressive drugs are not enrolled. So we really don't have any particular data on patients with autoimmunity as well as patients with immune suppressive drugs. I must point out that there were four cases of Bell's palsy uh, in the vaccine group, whereas no case of Bell's palsy in placebo group. Now, these four cases are amongst 20,000 patients who were given this vaccine. So it's quite safe even if it causes Bell's palsy in minority of patients. Based on all the scientific evidence reviewed by FDA, FDA announced that they believe that the Pfizer and BioTech mRNA COVID-19 vaccine is effective in patients at age 16 or above. And they also said that overall benefit outweighs the known risk of this vaccine. With this, I hope I am able to summarize some key points of data involving this Pfizer mRNA vaccine. In the next video, we'll talk about what about the safety and effectiveness of this vaccine in patients with autoimmune conditions specifically, as well as patients on immune suppressive drugs. Thank you very much for listening to this video. I also look forward to the next video, which will specifically address some of your concerns.